Hello, and welcome to episode 17 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topic, inside looks at our team, and more. Today's episode is a deep dive on peak week, what it looks like to go through a peak week with physique development. What can you can expect from today's episode is for us to break down what a peak week is, what it looks like to go through a peak week with physique development, as well as some of the intricacies of peak week as a whole. As always, our goal is not only to supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topics or questions, but also to plant some seeds for further research and thought. Without further ado, let's get into today's topic, peak week. So, Alex, do you want to cut, top it off and just talk about what Peak Week looks like? Yeah, I, I would like to start with, um, for our, our consistent listeners, we apologize for being a little um, absent for a short period of time. It's been crazy. Um, and we'll, we'll be able to share some of the, the things that we've been doing behind the scenes here soon. I, I know that uh, we just recently launched our app. And, and if you are a listener and you are someone who uh, is utilizing the app, we hope that you're enjoying it and, and um, having great results in utilizing it. Um, and then also the competition season has kicked off. And uh, this is a great timing for this question as we have many athletes going through peak weeks. And I think that it will be beneficial for people to uh, hear about how we go about things as well as learn more about peak weeks in general. So um what a peak week is, is simply the, the week prior or seven days prior to your competition. So we are peaking in terms of your physique. You may hear a peak week or uh, something within uh, powerlifting. There may be other terminology, peaking performance on that front, but within uh, bodybuilding and, and bikini competitions that we are uh, working with most consistently is just the, the week prior and, and manipulating many different variables to allow for the best look to transpire on that stage on that you know Saturday, what you've been working for for 12, 16, 20 plus weeks, um, you know, bringing it all together at, in one moment, you've got about 15 seconds up there and you've got to maximize, uh, that look. And, and that's what this entire week is, is about. Yeah. And something within peak week is that a lot of people are confused. I know I just had a first time client compete and her best friend and her husband were there and they were asking me a ton of questions about peak week. And they were like, I was so surprised that she was doing less cardio or eating more food or anything like that because they're thinking, okay, she's worked this hard and she's pushed this hard. She just has to push harder this last week. And I think that's a common misconception going into the week. Um, and like Alex said, it's a Time that we want to peak your absolute best physique. No one looks like they do on show day outside of show day, or they shouldn't at least. It's basically that one moment for you to look your absolute freaking best. You'll still look really good, obviously, throughout your prep and during peak week, but we're trying to have that moment where it's like, this is the moment I look the best. Um, and with that, it's something that you do want to taper things down. If you think about something like a marathon, obviously if someone's training for a marathon, they're not running a marathon the week before their marathon. They are making sure that they taper off that training so they're all set to make sure that they have the absolute best performance throughout it. So it's something that's a pretty or a little bit easier for me once I kind of put it in that perspective of what that looks like is that this isn't a time to go hard. Um, I guess we can kind of start off on what peak week isn't. Peak week isn't a time to necessarily get leaner. You should already be as lean as you should be. Um, you might see the scale change, but it's not necessarily the time to lose fat, I guess I should say. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be something where um, you think that this is going to be like the turning point for your physique. Like, at the you know, seven day, 10 day marker, you're like, okay, now it's time to really turn it on. And this is where we're going to see all this change. Like if you're fat seven days <laughs> out, you're, you're going to be, um, you know, out of shape when you get up on stage in seven days, it's not going to be this mythical situation. Um, and, and, and fat is a very strong term, but <laughs> in terms of competition, um, conditioning and things of that nature, it, it's not going to change all that much in seven days, just as it wouldn't have changed in seven days time, you know, prior to that week. 
Yeah. And I remember my first peak week ever, someone told me that I was going to change a ton. They were like, don't worry, you'll drop like five to 10 pounds in peak week. And like I said, the scale may change in peak week. You might hit a new low that might happen, but it's definitely not the goal to lose excess fat. The work is already done. <laughs> You're just going into that week to peak yourself. Um, so peak week is not for losing fat. Um, it's not magic. Um, it's definitely not a time to do hit or introduce anything new. Um, and it's not a time to train super duper hard. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing that a lot of people run into is that their, their training execution and the way that they go about their training is, is very intense and their eccentrics are not all that crazy. And their, their concentrics are very fast and explosive. Um, and then they get into peak week and they, they think that, slowing things down and having all this tempo is going to bring out the detail in their physique. And, and in reality, that much time under tension prior to the show where you haven't had time under tension within your training for months is a very poor idea. It's going to accumulate a lot of inflammation, especially a lot of eccentric loading specifically. Um, it's going to cause a lot of issues and you're going to look watery and blurred and your lines are not going to be as, as, as deep. Um, so I encourage you, if you're someone who is not utilizing controlled eccentrics and not utilizing um, tempo within your training prior to peak week, please do not implement it the week of your show because <laughs> that is going to negatively influence your physique uh, abundantly. Yeah. And to branch off of that, talking about what that looks like within training, some people might think like, oh, okay, I do need to slow things down during peak week. Or now that I have more food and less cardio, I should really push myself because I need to squeeze every ounce out of this um, prep. Or it would be something where they go through a ton of lengthening exercises. So um, Alex, do you want to touch on that as far as just some generalizations for programming? Obviously, it'll be very specific for each person. And Alex will even touch on this in regards to McKinsey and what that looks like. Yeah. And as we we're, we're navigating from a topic perspective out of what peak week is not and kind of now talking on what peak week is just for for you as you're kind of <laughs> you know navigating through this. But uh, within the training aspect, really what your tool or it, it is a tool for nutrient partitioning at this point, we are wanting to get the nutrients and, and muscle glycogen elevated to the tissue that we need. Um, to be at its best within your, um, within your physique. So especially with bikini competitors, what we'll focus here first is that we're wanting to improve hamstring and glute density as a whole. And so we're wanting to push as much of that glycogen to the glutes and the hamstrings, the delts as well. So those are going to be three, uh, components that we want to have a little bit of, of quality frequency throughout the time. I think that the thought process that many, you, you may have heard of like your last leg session should be you know, uh, seven days out or what have you is, is not inherently true. Maybe your, your hardest leg session, maybe is seven days out, but with a lot of our girls, um, we, we still have them training glutes. Uh, you know, I just had McKenzie was here actually just training and she's two days out. Mm -hmm. So I, we had a little bit, I mean, just a touch up on glutes. She's got a little bit more food. I just want to keep pushing, um, or, or needing that desire to that tissue of needing to push that glycogen there. Um, so within the training, you're wanting to taper things down, utilizing exercises that you have. Um, and what I mean by taper is tapering the overall volume down, utilizing exercises that you've done uh, throughout the prep itself. So not introducing these new you know, fancy exercises by any stretch of imagination, having a tempo that's pretty fluid. We're not wanting to do any pauses or isometric holds in the shortened or lengthened position, lengthened for sure. Um, but just getting through the motion again, it's for nutrient partitioning. It's not, we're not going to put on new muscle tissue. We're not going to, um, uh, you know, lose more body fat. This is a time for us to decrease overall inflammation, um, utilize exercises that we've been performing over time. And, um, yeah, is there anything else? Um, I just wanted to talk about the variance within training as far as what that looks like, um, when it comes to. Push, putting someone's peak week training and something within peak week is that oftentimes you'll see coaches doing daily check-ins or multiple times a day check-ins and kind of what can change within peak week training, even within the week, if mm. you've had it laid out. Yeah. Uh, I think that with the training component, it's going to depend on, on also how the, the physique is looking. Let's say that they are, 
Um, gosh, there's so many scenarios because there's so many different ways that you can peak an individual. And so the training is going to go alongside how the nutrition is going, um, whether it's a back load or a front load, um, of, of the carbohydrates that the individual is taking in through the the peak itself. But, um, you're going to really dictate the, the training off of the individual and off of the notes that you have, you know, prior to the peak week. So let's say that, um, uh, we'll, we'll continue to use McKinsey as an example. She's competing this Saturday. Um, and, and some of the other girls that we have competing on the same day. So for McKinsey, she looks her best after just, you know, after a day of training, some of the other girls look their best after two days of, of rest. So some of them will not train Friday and then obviously not train on show day, but McKenzie's going to look her best off. If she trains just a, a little upper body session on Friday, get some circulation of nutrients, move her body a little bit. Um, it's not going to be anything stringent, but she'll look great on, on Saturday. Whereas, uh, two of the other competitors that we have, uh, specifically it, it's Emma and, and Megan, both of them are going to be in a situation where they look really good after one full day of rest and letting some of that food sit, let them relax. Um, and I, you know, you could say a couple of different things as to why that is just as these examples, I would say that, um, potentially Emma and, and, and Megan specifically may have a little bit of higher stress response. And so as they have that rest time, that cortisol is going to drop down, their nutrient partitioning is going to improve. Those glycogen stores are going to improve where maybe McKinsey has a, a lower stress level just overall, and she's able to, to have a, a positive um, distribution of nutrients. That's all hypothetical, of course, and, and I, there's no way to necessarily know that. But from a coaching perspective, you can kind of connect the dots with your time in terms of working with, with athletes specifically. Yeah. And I'll say that when it comes to peak week as a coach, if you're listening to this, the best thing that you can do is just take notes along the way. If you've been working with an athlete throughout a prep, you're getting to know their body. Like Alex said, he knows what they look like after one or two days rest. He didn't just come to that conclusion off the top of his head and be like, I think that's the case. He got them lean, got them to where they needed to go, and then experimented with things so that peak week would run a lot smoother. So I I have an athlete also competing this Saturday and it's something where she is very, very active. So we've had to kind of play around with taking cert like a certain amount of rest days, also allowing her a certain amount of refeeds. And so that's been a phenomenal because we have all of this data of how her body responds and what that looks like. And so she's someone because she's on her feet a lot, she's used to moving around a lot. I do still have to have movement in because if I, and I've seen it on her physique, if I completely let her rest, then and we see a lot of blurred lines. And so we need to bring it down to let her rest a little bit to be able to have the sharpest look on Saturday. So the best thing that you can do is getting your client as close to ready beforehand, giving structured refeeds, giving structured rest days, having them send pictures more than once a week. This is the one scenario leading up to a peak week in a prep that it is completely fine to check in with a coach more than once a week. Outside of that, more than once a week is definitely not needed. Um, but it allows you to see that data to get those pictures um, and to see those fine tuned things. That's what peak week, I would say, is just all about seeing those small changes that maybe to someone else be like, well, they look the same in the other picture, but to you, to a trained judge's eye, they know what they're looking for. They're looking for those small, small changes that you're making. So in the theme of small changes, we'll talk a little bit about water, potassium, um, and sodium, because I know people have um, asked multiple questions about what it looks like within sodium. Do you completely remove it? How does that look um, for a client? Client, and I will say it depends. So, <laughs> so what's the question? Talking Just about talking water, about sodium, <laughs> potassium, and yeah. why we manipulate those things. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is is going to vary per person, but these are going to be components that you want to uh, manipulate. And with the electrolytes, uh, this is going to to aid in getting those carbohydrates pushed to the the muscle cells. So, if both of those are not present. Um, and we've got other, some other components that need to be present to the glyc glycogen itself, the water. And this is, you know, this goes in, in tandem with the aspect of, of coaches completely cutting out water and, and, and understanding the, uh, the sodium potassium pump and, and how the glycogen and, and, uh, gets into the muscle cell. It makes it abundantly clear of like cutting out water entirely is a very, not good idea. Um, for the majority of, of people, I think that there, there's a, a different way of, of 
peaking as, as you guys can imagine, peaking a bikini athlete and peaking a 260 pound, uh, you know, bodybuilder. There's going to be pointing at me when he's talking about that 260 pound bodybuilder. (laughs) I mean, that's the next division I'm going to. Right. It's totally, it's two, two different ways of doing things. There's going to be things that someone who's peaking with that much muscle tissue is going to do differently than someone at 120 or 130 pounds on stage is going to look, you're talking, you know, double the size of the individual. So within that, um, we do, a, a, we are a, of the train of thought that we keep water pretty high throughout the week. And then we do have water on show day for, for all of our competitors specifically. And then that's going to vary in terms of the quantity of water. And that's something that you need to pay attention to, um, prior to the fact. And so something that we do with our, uh, athletes is that, as we're going through peak week, we try to have them train around the time that they are going to go on stage. So uh, with this show, we're, we're anticipating the girls to go on around 1130-ish. Yeah. And so we've had all of them training around that time frame. And so practicing kind of what meals we want to do prior to the training session, or I'm sorry, prior to them going on stage for pre-judging and then getting them going through posing post their training. So we can kind of get an idea of like, okay, this is how much water you had. It's a lot of data collection as a whole, but how much water, how much sodium, how much potassium. And those components are, are going to be uh, varying throughout. I've, I've done peak weeks where I've done things that are the same in terms of sodium potassium being equal. So maybe I do like four grams of each. I've done that before and had success. I've also done a, a greater quantity of sodium throughout the entire week, maybe five grams of sodium and maybe two to three grams of potassium. That works out great too. And it really just depends on the individual. Again, you got to pay attention. I think that if it's your first peak week, don't be as... Um, as cute with it, if you will, <laughs> you want to be as, as, as normal as it, like I try to be as conservative as possible within that first peak week for a client to get a feel for what they're going to adapt to. And as you get more and more experience with that client, you go through more and more shows. This is a, a component where you could go on a side tangent of why you need to stay with the same coach. Yeah, like, <laughs> we could very much so spend, go on a tangent, spend your time really working with a, a great coach. Um, and well, really take your time prior to the fact of signing up with a great coach. And then from there, what you'll be able to do is, um, you know, have great success and, and be able to have better peak weeks moving forward. Um, so that's what we would a- advise on, on that front. Yeah. And Alex mentioned, don't get cute with it, but also I would say to not, I had something, but the computer to the side is glitching a little bit and it got me distracted. But outside of not getting cute, um, being able to take into consideration, um, I really just lost my train of thought. So if I think of it, I'll bring it back up. Um, But one thing about sodium and potassium is that they are going to work together to control water balance in and out of the cell, like Alex said. So I wanted to talk about some terms that you might have already heard us use or that we do use when it comes to a peak week. So those terms are flat, full, and spilled. So flat is going to be that your muscles are not round or full because the muscle tissue is not pushing tightly against the skin. So you might hear competitors say this, of, oh, I'm so flat. I'm so like, I feel flat as a pancake, whatever that may be. And that's because they're not having that glycogen to push against their muscles to show that rounded shape. Um, And then full is going to be that your muscles have those big round appearance and are typically pushing out tightly against the skin. And then the term spilled is when there's excess subcutaneous water. Um, So subcutaneous water is that water present right under the skin and it blurs definition, reduces the striations and separations between muscles. So with talking about that, I actually remembered what I was going to say. Don't get cute, but also don't get greedy with peak week. Yeah. And it's, it's tough to spill if you are in shape. Yes. It's very, very tough to, to truly spill if you are truly in shape. So take your time and, and get truly in shape and, and peak week will be a, a breeze for you. Um, but the work is, I mean, the, the peak week itself, the work is done. You're now just fine tuning things as a whole um, for you moving forward. 
So what I was saying as far as not getting greedy on top of that is just that don't feel like because you've seen on social media that, oh, I need to uh, carb load and have this huge increase in food to make it seem like your peak week is doing the right thing. Um, uh, One of my competitors a few weeks ago was talking about how she expected to have more food throughout peak week. But the fact of the matter was, was that I knew that if we gave her more food, it would not make her physique look the best. And so sometimes it's hard to have that conversation with clients because they've worked so hard and maybe they have this view of what they think peak week is going to be. So the more that you can be as clear as possible or be able to set expectations as soon as you know them is helpful, but also being able to talk them through why they're doing a certain thing so that they don't have this constant thing mentally of feeling like they're not doing the right thing. Hopefully as a coach, they trust you, they've paid for you, they've hired you for a reason. But anyone who's been in prep knows how it's very easy to get inside your head a little bit and start to question things. So um, it's just something of being able to kind of set out the plan and say it's always subject to change, but this is what it looks like. Because I've personally been through peak weeks as well as Alex, where um, we were in shape going into the peak week, but the peak was just not handled the absolute best and we didn't present our best physique on stage, which is very discouraging when you've worked so hard for something. to get up there and not feel like you've presented the absolute best shape that you can. So in regards to lowering training volume, lowering cardio, Alex, why do we do that? So within that, uh, the the reasons for it are going to be uh, to to lower overall inflammation. Um, so bringing down the uh, the cardio specifically is going to aid in, in potentially lowering some of that inflammatory response that you see on uh, competitors' legs. So, for example, if if you are doing uh, you could be doing uh, daily cardio, you could be doing daily fasted cardio. Um, and that's going to give an inflammatory response as much as you're on your feet type situation. Um, so we can mitigate some of that, the training response that part of training is creating inflammation. And, uh, that's part of the goal is, is tearing down those muscle fibers so that we can reconstruct and, and have stronger and, and, uh, more dense muscle fibers as a whole. So we want to break, we want to back off of some of that volume to allow for that inflammation to, um, not be as, as high. So that's going to, to aid in that. And exercise selection plays a big role in that. I wouldn't be having, you know, as I I talk about athletes training glutes, you know, closer to the show, it's not as if I'm having them get under a barbell and squat 315 or something of that (laughs) nature. Uh, It's going to be something along the lines of a 45 degree hip extension, something that's going to be a little less systemically taxing. You want to focus on things that are not going to be. And when I say systemically taxing, I'm I'm meaning like a full body, um, fatigue as a whole. So you, you want to avoid exercises such as that, but the, the main goal is just to bring down that inflammation. And this is going to give you that drier look. If you're in shape, um, is, is bringing down the the inflammation, getting off any of that subcutaneous water and, and putting you in the best spot for Saturday. Yeah. And one thing I will say, if you are an athlete listening to this is when it comes to peak week, the goal is to create consistency for predictable outcomes. So it's something that you want to have obviously as much consistency as you have your hold prep to make sure that your coach is getting that data to be able to make those changes. Um, It's also something that both of us and physique development as a whole, and probably a lot of coaches listening to this will say to not try to eat anything that is not something that you have eaten during the prep. Do not try to get cute with that either. And eating fun foods, it is staying with the foods you know digest well, that know sit well in your body. Um, and you know are going to benefit you in that regard. So it's something, for example, I don't do the best with dairy. I'm definitely not having any dairy in peak week because um, not only do we want to minimize any inflammation from training or cardio, but gut inflammation as well. So the more that you can stay consistent within what you're doing, consistent inputs so that the coach can see those consistent outputs to be able to make the absolute best calls from that. Um, so Alex, do you have anything else, whether it's on McKinsey's peak week, any of the other athletes that are competing, um, some uh, fun tips or tricks you'd like to give or anything else on peak week that you feel like we have not covered? 
Uh, I would say with the food aspect, you may see individuals having like a, a burger and fries or um, things that are just like untrackable almost because you don't, you're not making the food yourself. It's not an approach that we necessarily use at, at Physics Development. The reason being for this is that um, it, I, I like to have all the data. I'd rather not just guess and, and kind of shoot in the dark. I always find that having that you have an idea of the burger and fries, especially if you know specifically the restaurant and things of that nature, but it's also still not calculated to a T and, and especially that close to, to game time where you have that 15 seconds of something you worked for for 20 weeks. I don't want to leave anything to chance personally. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't advise going that route. Um, but if it works for you, it works for you. And, and that's, you know, that's your coach's prerogative. Um, do you want to go over, you know, peaking with us type situation, what that looks like? Yeah. And, uh, right before we do that, just saying a few other terms because they're going to be mentioned in peaking with us, but Alex briefly mentioned them earlier, back loading or front loading or a gradual load. Um, that is all in reference to the carb intake. So it's something as far as if you are going to feed a client early on in the week and let them dry out before stage, or if they look best when they have food right before stage. So just to give you a clue, if you're listening and you're like, I have zero clue what that means, it's all talking about when you're timing carbs for that athlete. Yeah. Basic thing here is that front loading would be, let's say you could, you, I mean, you could start a front load on a Tuesday and then, uh, have your highest food on a Tuesday and then taper that down into the show. And maybe you, you hit a low day, like a, a low food day on a Friday. And then you go into show day, a, a back load is going to be something where you're gradually, well, this is a gradual back load, but you would be increasing food and having your highest feeding day on a Friday. Um, and then going into the show that way too. Um, but there's, there's many different ways to go about it. Those are going to be the most common, if you will. Uh, and then there's, there are some coaches who just, you know, have you on low days and push you hard until Friday and then have you feed one day and then they, you know, they have competitors do well, but, um, I like it. I like both. I, I will utilize the back load. I will use a front load. It really just, again, depends on the athlete and getting data beforehand, um, and finding what works best for them. Yeah. Perfect. So let's go ahead into it. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of peaking with us and, and what that looks like, uh, is that we are, are painfully hands-on. It is something that I, I tell all of our competitors that, uh, if we're not best friends beforehand, um, <laughs> we will be best friends for about a week, a week and a half, um, with the show because we're just in such consistent communication. So on the, the Saturday prior to your show, uh, how we go about it is that we will send out a tentative plan of your, your training, your nutrition, your cardio, your supplementation, everything laid out to a T for every single day, the times for everything, uh, making sure that everything is crystal clear in terms of what we expect, when to, uh, finish your meals, when to complete cardio. Like it, it is a well-oiled machine for us. And then We'll send out a voice memo going over absolutely everything in detail, get on calls with clients, all those different factors. And that's kind of how things start on that Saturday prior to the show. Um, and then you'll have uh, daily check-ins with your coach um, every single day leading into the show. And so you'll just, you'll send uh, pictures, you'll, you'll send your weigh-ins, a, a short blurb of, of how things are, are going, how you're feeling, um, any training uh videos that we want to look over posing. Um, and then from there you'll get a response. I, I feel like we do a really good job of it being within like 30 minutes to an hour on mm -hmm. those days at the most. Um, and then you, I mean, at that point we use that tentative plan as our base, and then we may make some small adjustments off of that tentative plan, depending on what the look is, any of the feedback, maybe digestion issues you've ran into or something we need to manipulate. Um, and that's kind of how the week goes up until Thursday. So then we're just getting pictures and video, maybe post training and all those different factors, testing out some of those meals that we talked about. So I, we like to have kind of a rough idea of one to three meals that we could potentially use prior to the, the show to make sure that we have an idea of, of what digests the best, what makes them look the best, those factors. So we may have been testing that throughout the week as well uh, with their training. On Friday, when you guys uh, get your tan, so you'll you'll check in Friday morning, you'll get to your venue or your, your hotel, and you'll have your tanning appointment. And then um, on Friday nights, what we do is that we'll, after you get your tan, we'll run through posing, FaceTime, and uh, make sure everything is crisp, make sure that we're on the exact same page. Um, 
before or we know what time we need to be up for makeup and hair and all those different <laughs> factors um national shows you know that could be 3 30 in the morning hey some regional shows that could be yeah, 3 30 in true. the morning <laughs> bigger regional shows it can be the same too and for our um international <laughs> clients who are in dubai or australia it's like yo i'm staying up with you 24 hours this We're is going a, for this it. is an all-nighter um so it's just it's very hands-on it's something that um unfortunately we we have so many inquiries that come to us and, and have such poor experiences in that time frame um and it breaks my heart because it's like dude you you busted your ass for 16 18 20 plus weeks um and then the coach is just like unresponsive in peak week it makes n zero sense to me um and it, it, it infuriates me to no end so um yeah, I, I mean, that's a general gist of kind of what it looks like to work with us. Yeah, Alex and I have both been through multiple seasons ourselves. And so we've seen a lot of what to do, but also what not to do and how we want to be treated as athletes. And that's something that we take into massive consideration when it comes to the athlete. We have so many resources in play and so many things we talk about with first time competitors to make sure they are all set to go because show life and competing is just is a whole nother beast. Um, and so we want to make sure that you understand, like Alex said, everything is crystal clear. Everything is written down. Everything is mapped out. I'll get on a call if you have any confusion, because there's nothing we want to leave up to chance after you have put in so much work. And we've also put in work. So we want to see it come to fruition um, and being able to make sure that we are responsive. So even as coaches, Alex and I will vocalize to each other like, hey, I have this athlete in peak week, like this is I need to be on my phone, X, Y, and Z. So we are aware of what that looks like. So we can always have our phone nearby and make sure we're getting back to people. But it's something that we also make sure that we have all of the times, like Alex said, of what people's appointments are so that it doesn't end up being like, oh, well, my makeup appointment is then when I wanted you to eat at that time. So being sure that we're all lined up. We get the show schedule. If you went to your check-in and they changed anything, um, making sure that we have the notes for that and that we're all set to go. And then basically show day, we are just at our desks or on our phones to make sure that we can get you everything that you need meal by meal, picture by picture and going over it. Um, because there are a lot of fine details to hammer out and to make sure that is your best on stage. Um, and so we always, always, always want to be so present for peak week um, because we've been through it. We know how important it is and we we care about our clients as well and making sure that they see that success. Um, but since you mentioned some people having awful experiences with peak weeks, why don't we end it with some of the funny stories that we have heard? Um, one that I heard that I didn't even know was a thing um, was a coach had a girl just eat dry oats, said no water, just yeah. dry oats. Dry oats and like just tuna for yeah. some reason or like dry oats and tilapia and thinking that the the fish I, I feel like this is dead i don't i don't know if this is like still a myth or yeah. something that people but it's like fish thins the skin when i i'm not sure how that would work i think that from a uh metabolic perspective in terms of how nutrients work i don't think that that's even possible like feasible <laughs> um I, I, not that I think I know that it's or not all the feasible. pescatarians out here would be freaking yeah. vascular, super vascular. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I think that the dry oats thing, I think that the no water. Yeah. I don't know if they're like super, like some of these are not super funny. They're just sad. I know. <laughs> No water, no salt. Yeah. Like um, multiple days, no water, multiple days, no salt. And it's like, Oh my gosh, just the basic understanding of physiology would, would teach you that this is not the right call but they still do it yeah. and they don't have the basic understanding, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I guess a lot of them are, I mean, they are they're more sad, sad than, because, they're more sad than funny. And it, it, the saddest part is, is like, if you are a competitor, like I've been in that situation, not knowing better. Yeah. Like I've been through a peak where I just didn't know what I was supposed to do, what I was supposed to expect. Like if my coach told me to eat fish, even though I freaking hate fish, um, so I would probably have done it because I was told to do it and I didn't know any better that there was different options. So um, it's something that I can tell you that you are allowed to have water, sodium, and potassium. It might be in different allotments, and that is a-okay. Um, but um, 
Uh, something else I will say about peak week, while we do keep a very close eye on sodium and potassium, also making sure that there's no artificial sweeteners just to, again, make sure they're not having any inflammation in the gut. Um, and then just taking like very close look at food logs to make sure there's not something that someone is including that you didn't want included. But I yeah. guess my fun, <clears throat> funny ending is <laughs> well, quite funny. <laughs> And, and with like the the sugar alcohols and everything, that that's just eliminating more variables. Like mm-hmm. the that's the the name of the game is that in peak week you want to have as as few variables up to chance as possible. And so eliminating carbonation, eliminating artificial sweeteners, as much as they are going to play a small role, it's more so for just eliminating all things that we don't have total control over type situation. Exactly. So. If you guys want a show day episode, definitely let us know. Um, and we'll be happy to do one of those or talk about anything else competing. Uh, but that will wrap it up here for the peak week episode, what it's like to peak with PD and just some common information about peak weeks as well. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I almost just said thank you so much for tuning in because we've been watching too much Max Tuning. But uh, thank you guys for listening and we'll hear you in the next episode. See you guys.